December, 1899. The world waits to greet a new century. The captains of industry are making vast fortunes on the backs of others. But down narrow streets and dark alleys in the big cities of North America, the future for many holds only the promise of starvation, disease, and a lingering misery. In Toronto, the city is ripe for social revolution. One man, helped by the woman he loves, will launch his own fiery crusade to defend the poor, challenge the rich, and fight bigotry. His weapon, a great newspaper. His mission, to help shape the destiny of Canada. His name is Joseph E. Atkinson. Nineteen hundred starts with a mass exodus. One million immigrants crowd onto ships sailing from Europe. They leave behind lives of poverty and squalor. Many immigrants choose Canada and make for Toronto, a boom city of 195,000. The city skyline is crowned by the spires of 238 churches. And almost everyone living here is of British stock. Toronto is poised to make the leap to industrial powerhouse. In Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurier's Canada, this transformation is fueled by protective tariffs, favoring homegrown industry. With the Liberals in power, business is in power. Because Laurier, whatever he may be seen as, as a national figure and as a uniter of French and English, was in modern terms a very conservative person. He believed in business and free enterprise and had no faith in government. More than 700 factories will set up shop here. This spectacular boom is made possible by a cheap and plentiful supply of workers. Toronto had its respectable side and its British side and then it had its other side. The poverty was quite shocking. It was just survival of the fittest. And if they didn't have family to depend on, they were out of luck. In many sweatshops, the workers are women or children who often toil for 60 hours a week. This grinding hardship is all too familiar to young newspaper man Joseph E. Atkinson. He was born near the small Ontario village of Newcastle in 1865, the eighth child of a desperately poor British immigrant family. Their only books were the Bible and the Methodist hymn book. His childhood of privation and uh, tragedy shaped him for life, and he would say later that he would never forget his own roots and what, uh, what built him. Uh, his father uh, was killed when he was six months old. His mother took in boarders uh, to try and make ends meet. The boarders and other working men complain bitterly about their hardships. It's young Joseph's introduction to the class struggle and it will shape his life forever. Nobody can escape his beginnings, and I despise the man who is untrue to them. The flood of immigrants is not slowed by the terrible living conditions. In Toronto, the population doubles in one decade, and competition for jobs is fierce. Without a social safety net, unemployment and sickness are the dread of every household. I know a place where a father, mother and two children live in a small house with 17 men. Little girls grow up without self-respect or privacy. What chance of those girls? 
Charity Cook Toronto Mission. For the homeless, there is always the poor house, named with cruel irony as the house of industry. It echoes from morning till night with the sound of rocks being crushed by feeble men. Starving women and children huddle abandoned in shanty shacks, sometimes in plain view of Toronto City Hall. They could look out their windows and actually see housing that was condemned as unfit for human habitation. In those houses, um, various immigrant groups and the extremely poor try to marry, raise families and, of course, um, escape from grinding poverty. They didn't always succeed, and particularly babies paid a heavy price for this. The infant mortality rate in Toronto is as bad as Bombay. Two in five babies do not live past their first birthday. Poverty kills the baby. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. The rich baby lives, the poor baby dies. Dr. Helen McMurkey, health reformer. Young Joseph Atkinson discovers for himself how fragile life can be. His childhood ends abruptly with the death of his mother, Hannah, leaving the Atkinson children orphans. He believed that, uh, that having to run a boarding house, that her relentless uh, working from dawn till way past dusk, 365 days a year, drove her to an early grave. The delicate teenager with a stammer is thrust into the role of a provider, earning a pittance singing hymns in church and working in a woolen mill. But his life changes dramatically in his next job at a newspaper in Port Hope. I did not have the faintest intention of becoming a newspaper man when I accepted this job. I wanted to be a banker, but six dollars a week was too good to turn down. Thus it was accident, not choice, that set me on my course in life. The publisher teaches young Atkinson how to write and opens up his library of radical writers to the young, inquiring mind. But the story that changes his life forever is Leonard Tilley's rise from drugstore clerk to a father of confederation. One can scarcely imagine the curious, thrilling, and exciting effect that simple statement had on me. It had never occurred to me that a clerk could ever rise to such heights. The ambitious young Atkinson moves to Toronto and soon becomes the ace reporter at the Globe newspaper. He shares a desk with William Lyon Mackenzie King, who will one day become Prime Minister. They become friends for life. And it's at the Globe that Atkinson falls in love with a beautiful, talented woman. Her name is Elmina Elliott. At 23, she is already a trailblazing female journalist in a man's world. Almina is smitten by the shy, hymn-singing Atkinson and writes poetry about their romance. The moonlight slants across the beach, the shadows nestle neath the tree, but wind and wave and shore and sky bring back a time not long gone by, the night you sang to me. Elmina and Joseph marry in 1892 and take a modest house in Toronto. Their daughter Ruth is born here. The Atkinsons are sublimely happy, but they also care passionately about many other children leading a tragic existence. <laughs> there is a stark, sordid, ugly poverty here in Toronto. If one could tell with absolute realism of the hovels one has seen, 
speak with blunt truth of the crushed people one has met in casual visits to back streets, <coughs> the words would horrify. <coughs> 